Welcome to the Neja Chuan Podcast. My name is Isaac Kamens. This is a bi-weekly podcast where my friend Jess O'Brien and I discuss internal martial arts, meditation, and qigong. Uh, this week we start a three-part series on the great Bagua Xingyi master Zhang Zhaodong. Uh, we start by taking a look at his life from a Bagua Journal article from 1993, the September 1993 edition. Talk about his early life, his training, uh, some of his fight stories and exploits. Uh, then we get into the Nagong portion of the podcast. We talk about the ever elusive opening and closing Nagong, and this relates to opening and closing joints as well as other parts of the body. We talk about how it relates to practicing Tai Chi and Qigong and a little bit how it relates to doing martial arts. The practice session that goes along with it will be in one of the later episodes. So stay tuned for that. Also check out our Patreon for exclusive content, interviews, and lessons. Uh, hope you enjoy the episode. Take care and thanks for listening. Welcome back to the Neji Chuan Podcast with Isaac and Jess. Today's topic is the famous Xingyi master, Lightning Hand Zhang Zhaodong. We've been talking a lot about the teachers of Liu Hengjie and the different masters he learned Xingyi from. And we found another historical thread that connects him to the famous master Zhang Zhaodong, who was, uh, you find his name all over the records of internal martial arts in the 20th century. So the last few episodes, we've talked about Liu Hengjie's teacher, Li Jianqiu, and his grand teacher, Li Tsunyi. Well, this is another one of his grand teachers, Zhang Zhaodong. And we stumbled across him when we were researching the big fight with the Russian Kang Tier. So we talked about the, the fight and we talked about the connection with Li Tsunyi uh, and Li Jianqiu. So Li Tsunyi and Zhang Zhaodong were good friends and they did these sort of we talked about they did these tours and this, this sort of promoted this uh, martial arts association that they had started together. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, somewhere in there, uh, Li Jiangqiu began studying Bagua with Zhang Zhaodong, who, who we'll, we'll get into his backstory in a minute. But that's the connection to why we were sort of talking about him in relationship to, you know, uh, Liu Hongjie because Liu Hongjie's grand teacher and Zhang Zhaodong were, you know, BFFs. Yeah, they're total good buddies and they worked together in the caravan business and then they founded a martial arts association together. And I think their students cross trained with each other and started, they were part of that movement of Bagua right. and Xing Yi and also Tai Chi all cross training together and kind of yeah. forming a bit of an alliance that we call internal martial arts today. I mean, in his lifetime, look, he's born, you know, before the American Civil War even begins, 1859. So this is way back, you know, this is the time before firearms even pretty much came into common circulation in China at all. And before those great technological advances. So he's, he's even 40 years old at the time of the Boxer Rebellion, which we think of as a long time ago. So he was already, you know, a, an right, adult this, man. So this is that sort of Taiping rebellion era and, you know, all of that mm -hmm. sort of, I mean, just, just about, I think. Yeah. 18, yeah. I mean, maybe 18, a little bit. 1860s. Is right? that the 1860s? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And the American gold rush is happening so, right so. before that. So yeah, he's born into sort of this older time period yeah. and it spends his whole life as a bodyguard. So he's fighting hand to hand with weapons against bandits as a profession. Let's get into his life and actually talk about him as a person for a bit. So Lightning Hand Zhang Zhaodong lived from 1859 to 1940. He was born in Hubei province. His father was a poor farmer and his family was often bullied by those in authority. Later in life, when Zhang became skilled in martial arts, he was very harsh on bullies because of what happened to him when he was young. As one biographer has written, Zhang Zhaodong was big and tall, short-tempered and bold. He firmly opposed those who were roughshod over the people and disturbed public order. So I see him as a bit of a hero with like a little bit of a Robin Hood vibe going about him to punish the uh, oppressors. Sounds like it. Yeah. Zong was he only had a primary school education. He quit school when he was young to help his father in the fields. When he was a teenager, Zong Zhaodong became a Xingyi disciple of Liu Qilong, 
a highly skilled master of the art. So Liu Qilan is yet another generation back that's connected to many of the Xingyi schools that, that we hear of here in the West today. And he's another figure that we're not even going to touch on yet. Yeah. Zhang Zhaodong trained assiduously and became an esteemed Xingyi master as well. So he's he's bought into the one of the top Xingyi schools, basically. When right. Zhang was 20, there was a famine in his village. So he left home and traveled to Jianjin, but had difficulty finding a job because his only trade was farming. So he began to demonstrate martial arts on the side of the road as sort of a busker to, to make a few coins, it looks like. Zhang hated to see people bullying others, so he'd always aid anyone who was being picked on. As his reputation grew, government officials recognized his talent for dealing with criminals and gave him a job as a thief catcher slash bounty hunter. Hmm. So this, you can see his career as a fighter is just getting started because yeah. he's beating up bullies on the street. Shortly thereafter, the famous second generation Bagua Zhang master Cheng Tinghua was visiting Tianjin and ran into some trouble. Zhang helped Chang with his problems, and the two became friends. Zhang mentioned that he would like to learn Bagua Zhang, and, Chen, and Chang gladly accepted. Zhang frequently traveled to Beijing to track down bandits who had fled Tianjin. Chang also introduced Zhang Zhaodong to Donghai Chuan, and from that time forward, whenever he was in Beijing, he studied Bagua with either Dong or Chang. So he makes an early life connection with the founder of Bagua, and so he's there from the beginning of Bagua as a publicly taught martial art. Yeah, I think he uh, mostly trained with Chang and, you know, probably met Dung. But Dung was pretty old, I think, by the time he met him. So, um, right. you know, it's one of those situations where... Right. So I connect with the top master mm -hmm. and then keep your training with his student going. As you say, you'd get the transmission from the, the you know, grandmaster, but you do your training with the young master, right? Right. So... But that's yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's still, I mean, if you look at the, his two teachers, like Li Qilan and, right. I mean, these, these are like, that it's like the source of the two art, you know, as, or as close as you can get in this. You know, right. or so I century. see why his name is so big, because he, he met both those guys at a super young age. So he was able to live well into the 20th century as a direct student of these two right. of the top guys ever. Right. So, yeah, Zhang Zhaodong, that's quite interesting connection there we're reading from bagua journal uh september issue of 1993 which is the probably the best biography of zong in uh, english it mentions here that lee Sun yi the famous Yi master it also trained with him at the at the same time uh they both together went to visit master dong ai chuan and chang ting hua and so their right. their relationship is fused there it, i think that may be even where they first met uh, yeah i mean I, well they were both students under Li Chi Lan. Li Chi, so, okay okay that makes sense so that that i think the so Li Sun Yi, Song Zhao Dong, Geng Shi Shang uh uh oh, i'm blanking on the other guy's name but there's a couple other guys who are all students of uh Liu Chi Lan's and you know they were sort of that first generation to really spread it you know right it says it says here that uh um, he continued to work as a thief catcher but he also involved himself in martial arts demonstrations and participated in a number of platform boxing matches against foreign opponents that's where they get up on the lay tie platform right. and fight against foreigners again here here's the recurring theme of kick the, yeah. shit out, kick the shit out of a foreigner and make yourself famous right it's a way to get your rep he liked to participate in these events because the better his reputation the easier his job became if the bandits were afraid of him they would not cause as much trouble when he tracked them down Zhang especially liked to become involved in fighting with platform boxing opponents who were boastful. He was best known for defeating a Japanese martial artist and a German strongman. During this period in China's history, anytime a Chinese boxer beat an opponent from a foreign country, it was big news. However, Zhang's dealing with the foreigners extended beyond the boxing challenge platform. So he, he defeated a Japanese martial artist and a German strongman. Which is interesting. That so it sounds like every different nationality was sending guys to China to fight on the Lay Thai somehow. As a, I mean, yeah, it was sort of. I think it was kind of the UFC of its day, right? Like, I guess so. Or maybe the WWF, right? Or, <laughs> or one mixture of both in a strange yeah, way. Yeah, it's partially a hype, you know, carnival show, but it's also, I imagine, some of the matches probably turned pretty real, especially after the first couple blows. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh at least from the stuff I've seen, it's the 
carnival atmosphere of it sort of the step right up step right up kind of you know <laughs> like thing where because they were modeling it after western circuses and things like that but then the stuff they were doing inside was you know a little bit more brutal than you know right Chinese yeah this so, and I think the lay Thai tradition of fighting on the platform definitely goes way back sure and for people who don't know you know the lay Thai is a it's a square boxing ring but there's no ropes so if you get pushed off the the side you lose i think it's four feet off the ground something like that well it depends from what i heard it's like it could be just a circle you know a square painted on the ground uh, but the higher profile the match with the bigger prize they lift the lay tie yeah, higher and yeah, higher yeah. up so like in movies you'll see it's like 15 feet off the ground right, or whatever yeah. you know but i think you know a high if you're five feet off the ground and you get shoved off this thing out of control you you could easily die from it so i think there's an element of risk in the lay tie that's pretty freaky it's a definitive into the fight i guess the refs know, like, can't yeah, yeah the refs can't throw the fight if you uh, at the that guy point off. it's like yeah like you get kicked in the chest and fly off the platform like that's the end of the fight right. you know like, the, the referees can't take it away from you right you know? yeah, so there's a lot less uh you, know. you probably don't even need a ref if you have a lay tie because hey there's only one way to win you know yeah as far as i, as, I mean i think there were different uh sort of levels of it mm. you know so the probably the rules as you got higher up in it were more uh well defined and you know they signed the little waivers oh you got to sign the waiver right? yeah. all that stuff you know like I said, one of the guys we talked about you know where they had signed the waiver and done the whole thing so so continuing the story of Zhang Zhao Dong, as uh, as a thief catcher, he was hired to do a pretty major mission here. On one occasion, there was an American ship in the Tianjin Harbor whose crew was stealing Chinese women to take back to America and sell as prostitutes. The Chinese police, who were probably being bribed, did nothing to stop the pirates. In a last just ditch effort to save the girls who had been captured, the local official sent Zhang Zhao Dong out to the ship in a small boat. Zhang got up on the boat and fought with the pirates. Some accounts of this event tell of him fighting as many as 40 pirates. Whatever their numbers, Zong defeated the pirates and saved the girls. Because he had beaten so many men in so little time, he learned the nickname Lightning Hands. It is said that although he was big and tall, he was also extremely fast with his hands and feet. His fur work was very smooth and lightning fast. He was not afraid of weapons other than guns because his footwork was so good, no one could touch him with a weapon. Hmm. Wow. So that's um, a, another Robin Hood type thing. Yeah, that, there we should mention there there are several pictures of him floating around that are really kind of iconic. You know, the most sort of one that co comes to mind is he, where he's doing the really extended Santi. Uh, that's kind of like the, the most popular one. But there's also one where he's doing a really low sort of snake posture, and you know, so you can see he is a really like tall, long looking dude. Yeah, yeah. You know? Looks very strong, and here he's super flexible, you know, squatting super low in his bagua stance. Right, so it's like, hmm, I could see how that would be formidable. Yeah, we, you, know? you can see this guy built his reputation, you know. He's a yeah, hero yeah. from down below, rising up, beating up bullies, and plus he's connected to all these other masters. Um, another good story is uh, the story of the fight in the opera house. Um, so Zhang Zhaodan loved the Beijing opera. One day, he took his top student, Han Musha, to the Tianjin Theater to watch the opera. The first 20 rows of seats were made up of long rows of benches. They sat down in the front row. Um, so they're watching, watching the story about a, a martial arts master who fights the tax collectors. Um, just as a moment when the hero came out on stage, a group of gangster types sitting in the audience started to throw things at the actor playing the hero. The whole theater was in chaos. John got mad and grabbed one of the hoodlums, threw him on the stage, jumped up after him and held him down with his foot. He scolded them all and said, what is the reason for this? Heaven will not easily forgive this kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. If you want to cause trouble here, I will take it personally and you'll have to deal with me. Song Zhao Dong. That settled them all down. The guy he was standing on started begging for mercy and said they were working for the local gang leader who forced them to do such things with threats of hurting their families. We don't have a choice, he pleaded. John let him up and asked him who the gang leader was. The man said it was Yuan Lung. Zong didn't know it, but Yuan Lung was sitting in the front row watching all of this happen. After Zhang had become so angry, Yuan Lung didn't dare stand up and tell who he was. He was afraid of Zhang Zhaodong's martial arts skills. So it goes on to tell the story about how this villain Yuan Lung is like uh, pressuring the girls from the opera 
to uh, come to their gang, you know, and stuff. And so there's there's all this sort of drama going back and forth. In Tianjin at the time, crime was well organized. Yuan Long went to one of the big bosses for help, and they plotted to kill Zong. They got together 30 martial arts gangsters and challenged Zong to a fight at a place called the Mian Myung Temple. All 30 of the thugs came there to fight. Zhang was famous for the use of a whip. He showed up with a 10-foot whip Whoa. wrapped around his waist. He also brought his student Han Musha and his good friend and boxing brother, Zhou Yusheng, with him. So, so the three of them are going to fight. The gangster boss and Yuan Lung saw that there's only three and felt that this was a big loss of face. Zhang had known he'd be fighting 30 men. The fact that he only brought himself and two others to <laughs> handle them all was an insult to the gangsters. There was. The leader of the gang sent two of his best fighters out to fight. John got his whip, which he had nicknamed the Red Cross, because when he used his favorite technique, he'd whip the opponent twice in rapid succession and leave a red cross on their body where they were bleeding. <laughs> Damn. This is this is hardcore. There's going to fight 30 guys. Yeah. So, I mean, just to uh, make a long story short, they get into the fight. He starts whipping everybody in sight. His buddy, Zo starts using uh, the Leon Juan continuous linking Bagua John. And then fighting gangsters getting knocked all over the place the gangster boss when seeing how good they were knew that the gangster martial artists had no chance so he told all the gangsters to attack at once the remaining hoodlums came forward chang drew his whip out and it was as if his whip had eyes every time it lashed out it hit its mark every time the whip struck the opponent would drop his weapon the bandits tried to streak around behind chong but zo and Han Musha stood behind him to protect him mm-hmm. Confident that his back was covered, Zong increased the intensity of his attack, whipping his way through the mob. He eventually worked his way over to where the leader was and struck him with the whip, cutting the crime base's boss's face open. At that point, the gangsters lost their fighting spirit. They threw down their weapons and ran. Zong said, if I ever see any of you in the street, you'll have to deal with me again. For a long time after this, the group of gangsters didn't show themselves on the streets of Tianjin. And that's a movie right there. <laughs> that's great. Forget Yip Man. We need a Zong Zha Dong movie. Yeah, seriously, man. That's great. Tell the real story. Well, anyways, so that's there's a whole bunch of other stories about the life and times of Han of uh Zong Zha Dong. Moving on to the next Nagon component, we wanted to spend some time on opening and closing, which is a is I wanted to speak on a little bit. It's a it's a special one to me because it's one of the ones that I felt most you know, confused by when I first came across it, I'm like opening, closing, what's all that? It seems like, it seems too small to do much. And I remember, uh, Isaac, we were doing the training of heaven and earth out at, uh, one of the retreat centers, ions, I think. And, uh, so I came to do some of the training and we were doing a lot of pulsing and opening and closing and stuff. And I was kind of getting it and, but kind of felt kind of, I don't know, this is, is this really happening? Is it really working? And, I kept asking about martial arts. So, of course, up in front, you know, Kumar is like, martial arts, this class isn't about martial arts. Quit asking about martial arts. And uh, but then at the end, he's, you know, the class was wrapping up and he said, OK, everyone who's interested in martial arts, come up here right now. And so I came up to the front and the whole crowd that had before been uninterested in martial arts suddenly you know, came streaming and surrounding us. Right, right. And, uh, That's always how it works. And man, he just started whomping on me using, God, just it felt like Xing Yi and Bagua techniques and just gave me a pummeling. And uh, uh, the one that stands out is the the rapid fire sort of chain punching, the thing where he does where he sort of punches mm-hmm. from down up your body, like right on the center line. So I kept trying to block him and he just kept throwing these punches one after another rapid fire until it ended with uh, a hook around you know i blocked maybe one of the higher ones and he hooked around and hit me right in the back of the neck at the occiput there and i gave me a little seeing stars shot to finish it off and at that point i was like man i'm a believer now because the thing about it was it seemed like with the opening and closing it allows you to your joints spring in such a way as you don't really have to pull back and shoot out over and over like a piston it's almost like it's just rubber where like a rubber band, it just springs back and forth one after another. And there's no, I, once I, if I tried to block one of them, another one was already shooting over the top. And if I went after that one, the first one was already coming. So like it just enabled him to create a level of speed that I, I hadn't really witnessed firsthand before. It, and it wasn't like a muscular speed or whatever. It's just, there's this springiness that comes from the pulsing and the opening and closing that I found 
really interesting uh, when it finally got exposed to it. Yeah, well, let's first just talk about what it is, and then I'll kind of, I think, explain that bit of it. Um, so the the action, right, is just the very slight compression and expansion of the space between your joints and these larger, what are referred to as cavities inside your body, these spaces like your solar plexus, your armpits, things like that. And what this compression and expansion and release does is it um, creates sort of a, a spring inside, like an internal spring inside the body. So you can see this really well in babies. You know, they just have this sort of bounce. Um, I mean, it was one of the things I first noticed about you is that you kind of walked with this kind of bouncy thing. <laughs> and I was like, she's got more spring than most of these guys. But but just that that sort of bounce that a young person has that an old person doesn't have. That's kind of the spring that you're looking for. And so what it what the the practice is is you're learning how to compress this spring and and find the right moment before it locks up to release it and that creates this sort of uh ex expansion and you know release right so in tai chi it's it's the sense of you know opening closing is the term we use in english right that that there's a closing of your body and opening of your body another term they sometimes use is shrinking and growing right but it's just the sense that your body can actually physically expand and contract a little bit and you can use that to develop this internal you know compression and expansion it's not some sort of magical energy thing blasting out of your hands although when it's done really well it kind of looks like that because there isn't a lot of external movement most of the movement is happening inside the body so fudging is the term that gets used a lot in martial arts you see guys you know do a little movement and the other dude goes flying across the room that a lot of that is kind of the external aspect of opening and closing what we're talking about is more the in, internal sense of doing it like with your internal organs or your joints or you know smaller things like that so to get back to what jess was saying it does have this component of sort of rapid fire because you're not uh tensing and Con, you know contracting a muscle at the end and then having to release it it's that as soon as one sort of open gets to the end it circles back and it begins to close and so it becomes like a um sort of a circular piston right that that the the firing off of the left side creates the compression on the right side so there's no need to ever really stop because you're constantly just able to spring off of whatever it is that you uh, make contact with, right? Um, Bung Chun and Ching Yi is kind of the classic technique that uses this opening and closing thing. Uh, that's where you can sort of see the way it compresses. That compression and expansion the person. Is, is all about the crushing yeah. fist. So like when it comes to the first training of it, you know, it can be kind of subtle. I, I struggled a lot to try and, you kind of have to get your mind really into like we usually start with the wrist joints right and to get your mind into yeah. that space is no easy task no it is the it is the proverbial needle in the haystack right a lot of what learning how to do this is, is just getting enough uh like you know getting quiet enough getting you know focused enough that you can actually feel that space because there's a very small spaces in in you know in, in a lot of places and notice the first thing you notice is the fluid right that unless the joint is completely arthritic and you know destroyed in which case you got other things to worry about you'll notice that there's some fluid in there mm -hmm. right and that you can um over time, you can control the movement of fluids in your body the same way you can control anything else inside your body. And this is a big part of this hydraulic thing that happens inside of the body because we are mostly water, mm -hmm. right? So the opening and closing of the not, you know, liquid stuff is that's the, you know, that's the pump, right? But the liquid stuff inside, that's the, you know, the hydraulic fluid that makes the pump work. And you have to 
first learn the mechanical part, mm. right? That's the form. But then you learn how to feel this thing in between and activate it from inside. And this is really where, you know, uh, the internal part of it comes into it. Um, you're still doing things with your physical body, but it's it's just very, very subtle. And there is an energetic component to it, but that's rarely what you're using in martial mm. arts. Most martial arts have the sense of contraction and release, right? That, that, you know, you most of the time do it by tensing your muscles and then, you know, punching. And then at the end of the punch, there's a release and you pull it back. What this opening and closing does is it replaces the muscular tension of contraction with this closing of your body that closing of your body becomes your alternative to clenching your muscles. And so the reflexive action of uh, like tensing up and you know, tightening your muscles over time gets replaced by essentially relaxing and closing. Mm -hmm. Now this takes a long time to become natural. Right. This is the you got to make the unnatural natural. The most unnatural thing you can do when something is flying at your head is relax. <laughs> you know, so so you kind of learning to relax and then you're learning to kind of move in this very odd way that at first feels very you know disconnected and weird. But after a while, it starts to have this sort of integrated spring to it. So I think when it comes to this type of martial arts in this school there's a few things that stand out as one of the core skills you know one of them is this opening and closing because it's it's a real specialty of this system it's one of the real core things i think another one would be dissolving um another one would be spiraling but when mm -hmm. it comes to opening and closing there's something about that one that's kind of the most physical it's the most tangible right because like if you add that opening and closing to a punch suddenly your punch has a little more punch to it Whereas dissolving and spiraling too, but maybe it's harder to feel. It doesn't have that physical side to it as much. You know, they all have a physical nagong and an, and an internal nagong. So with something like opening and closing, the physical action just uh, mimics or pairs up with the internal action very symmetrically, mm. right? Yeah, that makes um, sense. So, right. So, it, so it's very clear that like, oh, if I'm closing my hand, you know, like my fingers getting closer together, I'm closing my joints. And when I'm stretching my hand open, my my joints are getting farther right. apart. So it's, it, you know, that, that part of it. So you can, I think, use the body a little more to kind of jumpstart it. And then once the pump is going, you know, it'll start, it'll kick in on its own. And, and this, you can see this a little bit with like, um, well, really anybody, but anyone who's like running and then jumping, right? It's that, it's the way you kind of, with each, with each stride, you load up a little more, load up a little more. And then on that third or fourth stride, you're, you're as completely loaded up as you can be. So you can push mm -hmm. off, right? It's that, but just take that and make it really tiny inside of your body, right? So instead of it being a large muscular, you know, contraction and expansion, it's you're trying to do it with the tiny little muscles inside your shoulder, right? And then over time, you start to have this space and then the space gets filled with fluid and then the fluid starts to move and you start to actually be able to manipulate that. So it's this kind of, layered process right so i think like all nagong kind of starts on the surface you know because that's the easiest part to feel and then you work your way in right and this one just has like i said it, the, the pairing of it just makes it the most logical in a sense i mean a lot of the stuff with dissolving um it, it's not logical mm -hmm. you know to think it is it's like how does you know how does letting go and uh feeling like everything is melting making me stronger you know it's it's, it's sort of this opposite thing right where with the the opening and closing it's very clear like how when you close and you kind of hunker down you you feel more stable and then when you release that there's this spring you know and i think it's just an easier one to grok on that right. level but getting into these finer points it's like just 
that's the sensitivity part where it, I don't know. Like I said, it's a needle in a haystack. Once you find, you know, once you find it, it's like, Oh, there it is. But it, it may take you a long time to, to really narrow, you know, to zero in on it. So what about suggestions? You know, when people are starting this out and they're trying to get that, that pulsation, you know, usually starts with the hands and the wrist because those are the most sensitive areas, but I've noticed the further uh, you get down your body, it gets harder in the hips and, and knees and ankles right. and stuff. Yeah, the 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 two things you usually start with are your your claw, your hips, and your wrist, right? Because the claw is the biggest one you've got, right? And the wrist is the most uh probably the most flexible. So you get the the taste of it, if you will, in your wrist. And then you try to mimic that feeling in your hips and other places, but you start with your claw because that's a big one. And you, should, you know, you get the sense of, can I make that same, you know, sort of squishy feeling you can make in your wrist inside of your hips? And, you know, the uh, usual experience is not so easy, but you start having these like moments of, uh, you know, it's like hide and seek, like every so often you hit it and you're like, oh, there it is. And, and you feel the bounce. And you feel everything spring nice and smoothly. And then, you know, for the next 20 or 30 times, it feels sort of clunky and you're trying to like find your footing. And, you know, and, and like you said, it just can feel very disconcerned. Would you incorporate that into the the squatting, the uh, quad squat that you do as part of energy gates? You'd, you'd sort of make your quad squat smaller and smaller until you can really just get into the very joint itself to with real minimal movement. That is the... I mean, if you want to really get into a true qua squat, right? Not a squat that involves using your qua. All you're doing is cl- opening and closing that space from about the top of your hip joint to maybe like, you know, a third of the way down your thigh. That whole space starts to open and close the same way your wrist does or any other joint does. And that creates this kind of like squishiness. So there's like a range to the quad squat from just a full on squat, ignoring any kind of energetic side of it to, you know, to narrowing it down a bit to getting to most precise, just barely moving, you know, millimeters, centimeters through the pulsation of the quad. You you kind of go uh, real big, do the physical part, right? That's like, don't move your knees, make sure your mm. spine is straight and you keep your, you know, straight is not the same thing as vertical, I should add right so that you can you can squat maybe you bend forward but at least your spine doesn't bend when you do it um and then you come up by bringing your hips forward um then you start with the sort of first level of the internal which is just to feel the expansion inside of your body a little bit like the natural oh when i squat things open up when i stretch you know things close or vice versa right And then once you kind of get the physicality of it worked out, and then you start this process basically of um, the big things kind of power the movement, the small things refine it, right? So Mm. I'm just going to use the qua and the wrist as the example, right? The power of it, you know, the, the, the ability to really get it going is going to come from your qua, but the ability to feel how it can move inside of you is probably going to come from your wrist so you get this feedback loop of the big thing kind of pumping up all the little stuff and then the little stuff sort of concentrating that pump or or directing that pump in a way that you want to you know target different things right the final stage is essentially you're doing it with almost no physical movement and it's mostly just you can control the fluid movement inside your body, um, which is possible. Like, you know, one of the things with healing my scoliosis was learning how to actually move my spine without the muscles. And then there's a whole sequence of, you know, how you develop it. And that's the head marriage of heaven and earth. Well, why don't we turn to doing a little practice now? Hey folks, uh, just a quick reminder, uh, check out the Patreon coming up soon. We're going to have, a Patreon only episode about Tan Shu, who was uh, Leo Hong Jie's Buddhist teacher. So if you're interested in the Buddhist side of the meditation things, uh, you definitely want to listen to that one. Okay, thanks for listening and take care of yourself.